Uh, first item uh, is 2.0 adjustments to the agenda. Uh, do we know of any adjustments to the agenda? Okay. Uh, next is audience and communication, and I'm going to assume our audience here is all uh, for item number four, which is a presentation on the summer school program. Is that correct? Correct. Very good. Then we will move right into uh, 4.0 presentations, uh, the summer school program. So. If you guys could identify yourselves for our home audience uh, and take it away. Thank you. I am John Strauss, the Director of Student Services at Shelburne. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the overview of extended school year services for our intensive needs population as well as our triple E population. All right. um, the guiding regs among, you want me to shut that, Ross? At the top is the uh, guiding regs 2363-7H, extended school year services shall be provided. And there's kind of four bullet points within the Vermont state regs and the one we're kind of looking at is given the severity of the student's disability presents a danger of substantial regression. All right. So our intensive needs population, this year we had six students, which has been, my understanding, has been typical for years past, kind of six to eight, right in that range. Two teachers, a special educator, and a speech and language pathologist. The role of special educator is to provide that direct services and do all the programming for the intensive needs, whereas the speech and language pathologist does the receptive, expressive language, augmentative communication skills. Those students all require one-on-one -on -one paraprofessionals. So we have six students, six paraprofessionals. They support each student under the direction of the special educator. It's set up as four days, two days on campus, two days off campus. They're both half days. They're all half days. On campus, the primary focus is the continuation of accelerating academic communication, social, and life skills. <clears throat> Given that within this group there's a high level uh, of regression and the rate of acquisition of a skill uh, occurs at a slower rate over time, there's a high need for that repeated practice and exposure of the skill. Off campus, the primary goal is going to work on life skills and the generalization of acquired skills within the communities. Any questions kind of related to the intensive needs population? Okay. The Triple E population, this year we had 10 students, seven of them were on IEPs, the rest were what we call peers, so regular ed kids. Again, two teachers, special educator and speech and language pathologist. One paraprofessional supported that whole group. Uh, their program's only three days. So two days on campus, one day off campus. Uh, again, on campus, it's the acquisition of academic knowledge, communication, social skills through a play-based and direct instruction program. Um, additionally, it's that kind of introduction to school for those triple E kids um, and kind of how you function within a larger peer group. Off campus, again, it's a generalization of uh, acquired skills. Kind of thinking forward to 13-14 ESY. I would like to increase the number of peers on the intensive needs and the Triple E program. If that doesn't work, work with Devin and Sue kind of in that inclusionary model where our intensive needs population works within their program. We support them that way as well. And the continuation of providing students with access to exposure to recreational activities and opportunities to generalize their learning again in the community. Any questions relating to intensive needs or Tripoli? Um, yeah, I guess the question I have is the, you know, as you stated at the top, uh, ESY services shall be provided. Yeah. Um, and, and we had a total of 16 kids take part in the program this summer. Are there kids who are recommended for this but that don't come? Uh, you know, kind of what's the, you know, the uptake ratio or, you know, people who are taking advantage of this, of, of the ones that we do recommend? Within our intensive needs program, uh, just every, every student in the program um, utilizes the services we offer. Mm -hmm. Not all the Triple E students do. Um, Triple E right now is 50-50. We have 14 kids, so seven are on IEPs, seven are not on IEPs. Um, and then within... Devin and Sue's program, I don't have the data right now on how many kids are actually eligible and access their program. It's kind of a, it's a larger conversation within, with Megan and other special ed directors. That's kind of how we, how we 
get the message out and the services we offer. Yeah, you know, I, I don't expect answers to everything, but I, I guess you know, it's are we are we able to attract or are you know the people who sh the kids who should be there are we able to get them there and, and if some of them we aren't what can we do if anything to you know, to change that I think you know coming from a different dist district Shelburne offers a lot during the summer and uh, you know that the program Alan's going to talk about that shader crop program and, and their program we do have a lot of options so it's you're right it's how do we get the message out that this is what we're offering and, and get them into our buildings during the summer Can you explain what a peer is? How that's identified? A regular. So, a reg, it would be a regular ed student, a student who's not eligible for an IEP, and who, someone who the student has made a connection with in the regular ed classroom. And we'd ask that student to come and join them and kind of and work with them during the summertime for the, those four days on. And what about the INS? Intensive needs? What's a peer within the IEP? The same. Just a peer within their classroom who they made a connection with. Ah, just a, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, I have probably the easier part of the summer school program. Mine's sort of nuts and bolts. Um, it's the finances, and you have in your packet, I believe, of, of those nice little colored graphs and figures, and I, I want to highlight a couple of them. They're fairly self-explanatory. Um, we had an, a fewer number of students this year. We had 75, and um, some of those kids went to Shader Croft. Devin will have the stats on, on exactly who went. The cost of the program, while it went down a little bit, um, there were nine, as you can see, the percentage went down. Um, the cost, which was 37.14 per um, student per day, of course included um, breakfast and a snack. It went up significantly because of the contractual changes in how we paid the bus. In other words, we in the past did not have to pay um, the bus drivers for um, two hours every time they leave the, um, you know, leave to take the kids, and that changed by about twenty-two hundred dollars. How much we had to pay for busing, so that that raised um, the figures substantially um, as far as expenses go. Um, let's see, that, and uh, as I mentioned, some of the kids went to Shader Croft. That brought the numbers down a little bit. Um, when you look at the um, percentage of kids in free and reduced, it's, it's pretty close to the same. It's been hovering around 14. Last year it was 14.9. Uh, um, does anybody have any questions about any of the figures here? <clears throat> okay, Deb? I'm Devin Morrill. I teach on the symphony team, sixth through eighth grade, and then I co-directed summer school with Sue for the first year this summer. Um, for our summer school, we had 75 students that attended this year. Sue mentioned that 10 of them went to Shadercroft, so the year before, those students were part of our population. This year, they attended an alternate summer school program we offered. Um, and of those, well, there were 75 that attended, and then there were 46 that were recommended and then did not end up attending in the end. So six of them were recommended and had committed and then just didn't show up when the program started, and 40 of them declined the invitation to attend. So that gives you an idea of, yeah. of what percentage <laughs> were recommended versus who actually come. Um, and I think part of what we're thinking about internally, too, is how we talk to teachers in the winter, in March and April, and, yep. and get on board with recommending all the students that we think should be in attendance as well, so that there's more communication home and that um, it's seen as a priority and we can increase attendance as well in the years to come. Um, the second page, well, I'll go on to what we measured, I guess. The student attendance there, I just did a breakdown of how many days they came when they were in attendance. So we had two girls, for instance, that attended for one day. So how effective could we be of the one out of 15 days that we have the program? So students are expected to come Monday through Friday from 8 to 12, so it's half days. And during each day, we offer um, a lit time, a math time. They have Lexia and fast math time, so it rotates on alternating days. The fourth through eighth grades attend Lego Robotics, and the K through three have a recess, and then they have breakfast and a snack. So that's what their typical program looks like. And um, 
For this year, we use three different measures to sort of track their progress. We are using the VCAT system, which is great, so as we move forward, that's going to have significant effect on our ability to track them in the years that come and the data that we can pull forward. Um, for grades one through four, it was recommended that we use the BAS, so that gives us a comprehensive picture of their reading level. So it's a text level, and the, the chart that you have that shows the text level will explain what text level we hope they're at at the end of each grade level. Well, it shows you the fall, and then the winter, and then the spring target level. So when you're looking at the chart that you have in front of you, grades one through four is the one that changed. So prior to last week, we didn't have all of the data in VCAT, and then this week there was substantially more, so I took a look at that again. Yep. What chart am I supposed to be looking at? So it says measure two BAS grades one through four. Okay, got it. Yep, thank you. Sorry about that. So again, this measure was chosen because it provides a complete reading assessment, and so the most, most significant indicator of their success would be their text level. And if you look, um, for first grade, it's fairly inconclusive in that we can't compare it to anything coming out of kindergarten, so it's their first year taking the BAS, so it's sort of flat data as far as that goes. In the second grade, um, five students who attended were able to increase their text level. So that's about 63% of the students in the second grade were able to increase their text level, <coughs> two of whom are now on grade level when they weren't previously prior to attending summer school. So we thought that was some great progress. For third grade, overall, the trend was that they stayed consistent or regressed. And for fourth grade, 58% of the students improved their text level or stayed consistent. So as you know, staying consistent is important to track as well. So we we're hoping to avoid regression, so we're happy with that as well. It's not as great as an improvement, but it, we didn't backslide, so we consider that a positive. And, and mm -hmm. uh, just uh, to make sure I understand yeah. what this chart is representing. Um, the students who did not attend that you, you know, got improved, stayed consistent, regressed for, when was that measured, or, or, or when was it measured for the students who attended? Was this something that was done this fall since we started back to school? Yeah. Sorry, okay. I should have clarified. So okay. we took their spring scores, yeah. and then we compared them with their fall score. Okay, yep. thank you. For the next page, it's the DRP for grades six through eight. So that is the measure that we use. It's degrees of reading power, and the BAS isn't given to sixth through eighth graders on a consistent basis, so the DRP is an accurate picture. We use the national percentile rank for their score, and um, fifth graders, it's sort of a gap year. They transition from the BAS to the DRP, so again, we're not comparing apples to apples, so we don't have any data for that selection of students. Um, all sixth graders who declined summer school regressed on their DRP, whereas one student who attended summer school improved. All seventh grade who declined summer school also regressed, and the same was true for eighth grade. So we found that students that didn't attend summer school and practice made no progress or regressed on their DRP from the spring to the fall, whereas in seventh grade and eighth grade, 50 percent and then 33 and a third percent, respectively, made gains on their DRP. So that was great to see. Um, so essentially no improvement in the students that did not come to summer school and 35% improvement rate for those that attended across all three grades. So. And then fact fluency. Um, currently, again, the assessments that we're using, the BAS and the DRP looking ahead will remain constant, so we'll be able to use those in the subsequent years as well, so that's a fairly accurate and comprehensive measure of their reading comprehension and fluency. For math, the fact fluency was really the only consistent measure that we have at our disposal currently, but what's happening this year is grades one through, or K through five, sorry, are going to be using Bridges Common Assessments, and so those are going to be tracked. So five times during the year, we'll have data points for all students K through five. And then as a district, we're gonna be creating a common math assessment for sixth through eighth grade. So we'll be looking to using those data points in the future for math to have a more accurate picture. Fact fluency is a time test, and so it's highly variable, I would argue. So a lot of this data um, looks messy, and it is. So <laughs> there are lots of data points missing, and there are different things that happen. They switch from addition and subtraction to multiplication, or they're just on multiplication depending on the grade level. So it's hard to compare the data from year to year and spring to fall. But um, we did see improvements in the seventh and eighth grade. So. Um, in the eighth grade, 50% of the students who attended did improve on their fact fluency, and overall 16% who 
who attended summer school improved versus 3% who did not attend summer school. So. Um, let me make sure, I want to ask you a few questions to make sure I understand the, the data in the program. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a three-week program yes. that runs when? What, what start and finish dates? When, when oh, the, the end of July and the first two weeks in August. Okay. So the last week in July and first two in August. Okay. Yep. I just, you know, wanting to understand because, you know, there were some kids that uh, that attended and regressed. Yeah. Um, and just sort of, you know, okay, right. you know, how long were they out and, and right. how do you, you know, how do you prevent that? I right. mean, for, for them, you know, maybe you could argue, well, they would have regressed even further, um, but just in terms of, you know, success measures for it, um, you know, and, and when I first looked at that, well, maybe if they, you know, run it, you know, last week of June and first two weeks of July, then you still have six, seven weeks. But I mean, really, it's kind of in the smack dab in the middle of, of summer. Uh, so clearly for some kids it's working and, and others, you know, uh, jury's out or you know, maybe yeah. it's not. So. And if we look back at the attendance too, that, you know, 63 and a third percent attended for more than 10 days, but then there is a chunk, 26% and 12%, some 12% came fewer than five days. So, okay, so they're, they they're they go to camps and then they go and do all these other fabulous things, which you don't want to deny them the opportunity to do. But if the instruction is consistent, then we would expect to make greater gains. So, the, the tests that uh, are given in the spring and in the fall, when are those tests given? So in the fall, the fall measure was just happening at the end of September, which is why the data <laughs> was a little bit crunchy in terms of the timing of the meeting. But and then in the spring, it's April, Mayish towards the Are end the of same school. tests given to the same to to the whole student population? Yeah. And what about the regression percentage? I mean, is there a is there a regression among the regular student population in the fall test? I did not look at that, but I probably could. <laughs> my, my I would guess that there is. Yeah. But these are the kids most vulnerable for a lot of regression. Right. But you, I mean, it's pretty well researched that there is regression that we anticipate. And so what Shelburne's doing is we're anticipating that there is regression, so we're providing kind of um, a quick, quick intervention, and then we're just relooking at the data, and they're, we're finding that they are moving forward given that just a quick intervention. Um, so but yes, there is that regression. As our basis for um, offering the summer school to students, we look at any child who's received any sort of services during the year. That might be in the classroom, it might be a pull out, any, any child that has any sort of services um, academically during the school year are targeted for summer school. So are the number of uh, families declining, is that kind of consistent over the years that you've been doing it? I mean, <coughs> like 40% yeah. of the people just can't make it work? Yep. Happens to fall on vacation time or they're <laughs> committed to other summer camps being... I mean, it's typically <coughs> usually the same families. That, that the come decline. or that don't come? That decline. The decline. Um, so, so we're asking them repeatedly and they're repeatedly saying no. In some cases. Uh, it, well, it, you know, here, here's sort of the caveat there. Sometimes the uh, families will choose to have the younger students go, and then as they get older, they don't come, or vice versa. <clears throat> I have to say kudos to the middle school because in the last couple of years, that trend has been more, we've gotten more middle school students than we have in the past. So, um, when, when, when do we generally identify uh, you know, who, who we would want to see here, and is, is timing a factor? Uh, you know, Unless they're going to go to summer camp all summer or right. go on vacation all summer, I mean, arguably, if we invite them in February instead of May, and I don't know when yep. that is, um, you know, people might be able to plan around it better. Uh, well, we so usually target in March. Yeah. Okay. So it's we try to we try to matter of fact, March is when we ask for the um, all the pull out people, all the special educators, and or the 
you know, the special specialized instructors. Um, we asked them for lists of students, and those are the kids that we target. And it's pretty much starts in March. It's been four or five years since I had to send deposits for summer camp for my kids, so I don't remember when. The, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the cutoffs. So that happens like in February. You start start kind of yeah. you start yeah. looking so, and you start yeah. sending those things in to get into the camps that you want. So. Yeah. So you know, I just you know wonder if we look at that. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, the timing of it. Yeah, see, see if that can have an impact, uh, mm -hmm. or you know, how far out are people, you know, booking, uh, you know, plane tickets or you know whatever they might for for vacations. And so, you know, I just wonder if, if you know, probably not that much is going to change from January to March in terms of who would be indicated for this program. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe if we get out in front of it a little bit more, we might have better luck with um, you know with attendance or you know people taking us up on the offer. Do you think families who are declining are using vacation and camps as an excuse and they just don't want to come or don't want to do it? Or do you think that's realistic that Sometimes there are conflicts? a yes. lot of persuasion on the part of the students, so yes. I think <laughs> six of one, half a dozen of yeah. the other, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, interestingly, you really have to follow up with parents. In other words, <coughs> you, it, it, it couldn't happen that you just call and leave messages because kids will erase messages or I mean, you know, <laughs> on and on. So you really have to make sure that you contact the parents and, and really talk to them about it. Which, and the teachers do a pretty good job of that too. Tim, moving from a, you know, I was in Chittenden East last year and now I'm at Shelburne. We had similar numbers decline. So it's kind of, yeah. it's not just Shelburne, you know, it's happening it's in the Richmond and number. those communities as well. Um, what are the hours of the summer school? Because I'm thinking that it could be an issue for working parents mm -hmm. to get their children to and from summer school and the hours that they're not in summer school, what do they do with them? They may, they may <coughs> rather than summer vacations or what are they, they may send their children to live with a family, another family member somewhere during the summer so that they're cared for or whatever. It may not necessarily, they may be embarrassed to say it's summer camp or... Yeah, it's their half days, so it's 8 to 12 students come from... That can 12. be very difficult for working parents to figure that out. We actually also, and I know you, you can see the statue that we offer busing, and so what that means is um, a lot of times they wouldn't necessarily deliver the child to the house, they go to a babysitter, I mean we, so it, you, you sort of have to play roadmap with um, the busing because the kids typically will go somewhere else. They'll go to a, a nursery school or, or we have to make sure that we deliver them um, to a different location often. So um, buses are offered so that that can happen. I think one real potential plus that we have this summer is we'll be running the part two program. That'll be our program. Yeah. So yeah. We'll, we'll have control over that. If we want to yeah. do something in that 12 to five range, we can make arrangements to make that happen. And we can take that off the plate and actually offer that, I think, as an incentive. And then there may not be that stigma for the child of I'm going to summer school while I'm in part two mm -hmm. at summer camp yeah. instead. Yeah. And nobody really needs to know that necessarily. Yeah, so. They can sign up for part two and then we can kind of grab them yeah, and give right. them that reading intervention or that math intervention, yeah, right? right? Did, uh, with the Y, did you offer summer programs too? through? We had a couple of scholarships that we negotiated with them, but primarily it was only available if a family had the funds. We, we didn't have you know, the ability to just absorb that cost. It was just presented, well, I'm sure they can come if you can pay. But now with part two, now with part two we'll, so if you really need to get a kid there, you can say we can cover absolutely. it. Absolutely, we've got some kids in the program on scholarship already, just because we know it's necessary. So that should really drive participation, I would think. I hope it helps. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that changed too, with regard to a seeming stigma, is that because now we offer it to not only kids on 504s and IEPs, the population has changed a little bit, and there are a lot more kids that, in fact, get some sort of a pull-out service, but they wouldn't necessarily be on a 504 and IEP that are coming. And so the stigma really, I, I don't hear that nearly so much as I have, you know, maybe yeah. seven, eight years ago. So I think that's changing, and I, I. Want to at least let you guys know that once again we really see the validity of offering food because there are just a number of kids who you just have a sense that you know that's 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 it 
for them and they come and eat breakfast. They come and it's, it's we call it a snack, but you know, right around 10, 30, 11, they eat again and they really eat. I mean, it's, a, it's for a number of those kids, it's a meal. And so, um, and I'm, we certainly don't um, hinder them if they want to grab a bagel and take it with them either. So um, that's a, a, a real good service for the kids. No, it's just been breakfast and snack traditionally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the IEPs in the 504 plans, I'm assuming there's some kind of funding that isn't necessarily from the district. I mean, is the district paying 100% of this, or is there some uh, funding that comes back to us from the state for, for these uh, students? Comes back. It's we get the, yeah. the standard yeah. reimbursement the standard reimbursed. for We do get reimbursed for it. Yeah. yeah. But, I can't tell you what the ratio is, but. And so we get reimbursed for the students who attend and the students that don't attend, or how, do, how does that work? No, no. Just, 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 just the students who don't attend. Just for the students. students just who those who attend. It's, all, it's going to be based on the service plan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For, for the kids who have qualifying service plans right. and, and who show up. Right. Mm -hmm. right. That's you, right. You, get, you yeah. get money for that, but if they don't have a service plan or they don't show up, then you because uh, I mean, it looks like roughly half the students um, of the 75 were, were not on 504s or IEPs or anything, that they're just kids that have been identified as needing some yeah. extra help, yeah. but that mm -hmm. uh, don't qualify for any services. And so the district pays for them 100%? I would assume so. Yeah. Yes. One thing that might be interesting to track as you continue to grow your program and um, mature the whole data collection aspect is and maybe you have and we're seeing your summary so forgive me but I'm just thinking out loud here about um, where these kiddos um, ended up in the spring and uh, what to what degree did they begin to catch up if they were behind grade level wise and just what does that look like because the whole notion of intervention is not only to we want to prevent regression but we also really want to you know escalate their growth um, so they can start to catch up so that might be interesting data to think about looking at I just one thought because we have the capability to do it now I mean it's not necessarily discussion for this group but it would be pretty interesting to track the kids in high school that in fact had used um, summer school during the their you know K eight experience, and and also the kids that had declined all of those years. It would be interesting to to see that data. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Who are the summer school teachers? So they it's a, a population of um, classroom teachers and paraprofessionals. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. One thing you might want to consider also is instead of having a three week program is to have a longer program if it's under the um, umbrella of part two, mm -hmm. so that it could be hourly as opposed to kind of that day. So doing a four hour day sometimes um, is a lot for you know some students. So under part two, the nice part is that you, know, you can pull them for just like mm -hmm. an hour a day, but do it over six weeks as opposed to three weeks if you're targeting say math intervention or one mm -hmm. specific area. Yeah, and within that, you could couple and you could have smaller groups. Exactly. I mean, yeah. You could yeah, do one to one or two to one or three to one. I mean, it's just right. so much easier if it's if the kids are there and mm -hmm. you know you can you can kind of play with their time a little bit. Mm -hmm. When do uh, families have to commit to part two for the summer? I mean, is I honestly don't know at this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're just surviving where we're at right now. And <laughs> so, but I'm going to imagine. Probably in <coughs> February, March is when folks are going to start to need to know that kind of commitment, if not sooner. You know, I've got a parent there. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but when would, when are summer decisions for? Oh, like I said, you start looking in February, and then yeah. all the camp, um, what do you call them? You go to the right to start conference center, your, and they have yeah, all the camps sign sitting there. Your, camp yeah. saying, you know, here yeah, come yeah. to our camp, come yeah. do this. Usually you get your brochures called. and so, then by yeah, like March, mid March I'd say. I just wonder when you have that list to kind of compare it to the list that Sue has. Summer and school and start and then how yeah. and encouraging and yeah. I really, really tried to get to get those parents targeted before they put the in the newspaper in the Shelburne Time or that Shelburne, whatever that is. 
Uh, you can tell I'm not from Shelburne, the Shelburne <laughs> News. Um, I try to get those kids targeted before they advertise the camps. Because, oh my gosh, they start so early. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a <coughs> definite point. Just don't come on Act Two, and then you say, "Oh, by the way, yeah. summer school in bed is here." Yeah. yeah. And Part Two is going to be a day long. It is going to be a day long. Yeah. And Sue and Devin, want to have you here, and we're about to enter the budget season. I guess my question would be: as we talk about, you know, if we were to able, if we were able to get all the students that were recommended into mm -hmm. the program. What would what would be the budgetary impact? What would we have to be thinking about for this summer coming up? In terms of, I'm, I'm assuming you couldn't do it under the budget that we, you know, if we just stayed status quo. We could not. Um, I, if if every kid came that was recommended, we would probably need five more tutors. Yeah. And that and those were not small groups. Those would be pretty large groups of kids. Yeah. But the absolute minimum of teachers we would need would probably be five. And obviously then that we would have to, um, busing would definitely increase because we, you know, we'd have to obviously take more kids around. Um, just statistically, I would think it would add probably a third more of the cost. How many buses are um, Well, we, if on a, on, in a good year we can use one, this wasn't a good year. In other words, sometimes <laughs> I've always tried to tag team with a special needs bus. And sometimes we can do that and sometimes we can't. Um, this year, again, the cost increased so much because of um, contractual agreements that were made with the bus drivers um, that, you know, I, and given the mechanics of where kids live, sometimes you just can't stretch it. I just find, you know, if we're running two or three buses, um, but those scatter, buses, well, but, but if those buses are fuller, Right. I mean, yep. if, if you're running two or three of them, but you're not really expanding the routes that you run and, and you just get more kids on them, then arguably right. that per head cost should not increase. I mean, should, the per head cost for transportation could go down. Well, sort of, if sort if, of if what you we had to add incremental buses for additional yeah. kids, then yes, your, your cost is going to But if it were more integrated into part two, the busing may go way down because people's right. they're, they're there for the day. Right, right. Yeah. right. that's right. That's yeah. true. Yeah. And now, yeah, if you, we have 20, you know, it looks like they had 27 of those students are on IP, so that's less than a third of our IP population. So there's some disconnect happening within that population. Yeah. So that's a, you know, that's a, I mean, I, I, the number of students we want to look at and kind of target to get them in, definitely to part two and into mm -hmm. new summer services. Yeah. And, and an extra 15, 20 grand, if, if everybody had shown up, uh, an extra 15, 20 grand is not a budget buster. It, it, right. It's a big chunk relative to the size of, of the program currently, but it's not a big chunk relative to the total the total right. budget. So, uh, <laughs> well, I'm laughing because <laughs> <laughs> if they all showed up, I would have probably had a heart attack. <laughs> given that, given that Alan said, I mean, and obviously I stay within the constraints of the budget. So. <laughs> I know what you mean, though. Come see Russ. You know, if, if more of the kids showed up, we would have had to yeah. find found a way to make it work. Yeah. You know, you, right. Unless it's going to be a, a first come first serve kind of thing, which you don't want it to be. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, you find a way to make it work, and it, and it doesn't break the, the total budget. It's you can do it. So. Just out of curiosity, do we survey parents or guardians to find out why they? didn't send their children to um not yeah. not per se but not formally but, but yeah. what i do is i actually if you look at my notes i actually uh, this is just between she and me kind of <laughs> but i question every one of them i mean casually in other words i say so yeah i guess planning on a camp or is there a way we can work around or yada 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 and then i make a little note so i actually have a pretty good grasp of why Parents don't send their kids. And this year was sort of an anomaly. Ten of them moved, and you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did they go halfway yeah. through the middle of the program. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, sure. One, one final question. Uh, it looks as though about almost forty percent attended fewer than ten of the day, ten days. So, yeah, combined. So thirty-eight point seven. So. Um, yeah. Given that, do yeah. do we still recover that from the grant, you know, the IEP or the 504 plan or anything like that? I mean, 
Uh, we don't. We get zero if for I, for those I think who attend. It's based on attendance. Yeah. yeah. So I'm sure they do. And if there's 75, 75 students, 27 of them are on IP, so you'd have to break that number out to see how many of those students were eligible for reimbursement of funds. But we were paying a, the, the teachers for 100% of their time, and so it really stands to, I mean, there's a real incentive for us to, you know, maximize the attendance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there is budgetarily, but there also is in terms of right. true the effectiveness, student, effectiveness right. of intervention. Right. Sure. And yeah. there are some researched things, mm -hmm. one of which is steady, day-to-day, -day, ongoing, relentless mm -hmm. practice, and the other is small groups. Yeah. And the research is pretty flat out about the importance of two to three kids at a yeah. time in an intervention setting. Yeah. Yeah. So that's something to think about as you sculpt next year. Mm -hmm. Any last questions? Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting me go first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we totally revamped. You know, we used to be. We'll used to be. We always day. covered that in the adjustment yeah. to the agenda. Okay, can we let them? And now we do. We've just <laughs> given up. I know this is so much fancy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next is uh, reports to the board. Uh, first is 5.1, the principal's report. Okay, so we'll start with our highlights. Um, we did employ Amy Buckley as our new SAP counselor. She replaces Margot Austin, if you remember Margot. And so everyone knows it's substance abuse program. Student assistance. Student assistance Pro program. Professional or program is what it actually yeah. is, but under that umbrella. She it's does substance, work uh, with okay. substance abuse yeah, programs. Time, that so yes, so it's, but that's not the only out. thing she does. Right. She well, actually was, does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So, that's okay. okay. That's a great question. Okay. Um, so, but she does work with um, you know populations of students around supporting choices, making healthy <clears throat> choices, and um, certainly what to do if if they don't. So. It's both sides of that. Uh, and it is through the CY program, Connected <coughs> Youth, Connecting Youth. Um, so she leads, she's part of our lead club that she works with uh, Rachel Petraska to, to support that group of middle school students and um, co-teaches our life skills. We have finished 16 successful curriculum nights. I know, I think I attended 12, so. <laughs> um, I'm kidding. But they were great. Um, we want to thank all of you who attended, school board members, PTO members, um, feed members, all the other people who um, get up and do a presentation and make sure that all of our parents and guardians clearly understand what all the good things are that are going on in, in their kiddos' classes. We just finished our last round of, well, no, we're not, I'm sorry, we're not finished, it's Wednesday. We have two more days of our last round of kneecap tests for reading and writing and mathematics. We will continue kneecap testing for science in the future. I don't know how long, but Theoretically that's... Theoretically 2017, but they okay. haven't even started. Okay. And we believe that SBAC is going to produce a new test for us. They've been piloting that test, so we'll see what that looks like, but I certainly don't know what the progress is on that. Do you? Well, they're know? ready for a very large pilot all okay. over the country, so uh, we know they're pretty far along now. Good. So, awesome. Yeah. So we certainly look forward to that. Um, and also we've included our science kneecap scores. We received those a couple of weeks ago, I guess, and this would be testing our fourth grade last year, our current fifth grade, so that's on the front page, that data. I draw your attention to 2012 and 2013. Um, I just always tell people that if you look at the state, uh, the DOE does a, um, or the AOE, I guess, um, does a compilation of all of the towns in the state and they do add proficient with distinction and proficient together, and then partially and substantially below proficient together, so they give you kind of two scores. So last year we had 70% of our fourth graders who were 
proficient or above in science. And this year it's 68%. So pretty flat. Would have liked to have seen much more growth there. And then if you flip the page, again, pointing to this time 2012 and 13 for um, our current ninth graders or last year's eighth graders, adding those together, it went from 56% proficient or above to 53% proficient or above. How much? Again, pretty flat. Yeah, but, um, and you know, not that flat is great, but my understanding was is that statewide the numbers went down, I thought, pretty dramatically. For fourth grade. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. so the fact that yep. we were yep. more or less flat, yep. you know. Relative mm -hmm. to the state. Relative, we do relative well, to, the, right. to the drop that the state had, mm -hmm. that's not, not horrible. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, so. You're absolutely correct, yeah. yep. And the same goes for the eighth grade, or is that uh, less dramatic? Uh, I think that was less dramatic. Less dramatic I statewide. Yeah. 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 So the, the, the statewide, they didn't drop as much. No. Okay. But, you know, I mean, it, the thing with, you know, two, three percent either way, is you know, year to year, is, I don't know is that really is statistically yeah. right. Yeah. G given the number of, numbers of students we have taking the tests. Um, sure. You know, I, you've got. I think you've got to look at longer-term trend data on it than you know from one year to the next. Uh, right. You know, unless it were you know if it were fifteen percent, that would be a different matter, I think. But mm -hmm. uh, when you get up into five and above, you start thinking about it. Um, the eighth grade scores across the state improved by six percent. Oh, they did. Okay. Yeah. So someone did ask us last night at our um, budget forum about <coughs> any reasons that we might be you know, wondering why our tests continue to remain how they are. Um, and the areas that we do see some continuous struggle is an in inquiry and a constructive response, which is the long um, part of the test, where kids do have to have stamina and be able to write, they have to be able to use vocabulary in their writing, and they have to be able to argumentatively write citing um, evidence to support their conclusions. And certainly our Common Core standards will address a lot of that. We're actually working on argumentative writing this year. So, you know, we're hoping that with all the push on those particular areas that scores will continue to go up. Right. If, you, if you look at this, you know, from fourth grade to eighth grade, 70%, and then it comes down to 54% or 56% proficient, um, does that, I don't know, when I look at the 56 number, I think, you know, should we put that, you know, 65% as a passing grade or, you know, I know that's not necessarily the case. Is this, you know, if we look at when kids go to college, are 50% of them majoring in science and math or less than that? And so mm -hmm. this really isn't a shocking number or as they get older, they tend to find their way and they're like, you know. My daughter's interested in gymnastics and art, but, you know, as she gets older, she'll mm -hmm. go that way. But 54% of kids are interested in science and go that way. Is that what we see here from fourth to eighth and that we shouldn't be surprised with this number? Or? Um, no. if, if it's I'm a long, gonna... rambling question. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. really no, have it's a, a question, question, but, you know, is, is it specialization as kids get older? And how does it relate to the kids that are prepared to go into science careers? So I can comment, you know, 50,000 feet up yeah. a little bit about the whole um, push and concern around students who go to college and aren't adequately prepared to compete in science coursework. Uh, and, or those kiddos who don't go on to college, but um, places like IBM are seeking entry level students who graduate high school. And what our IBM plant is saying is, our kids, we're talking Vermont, not just, not just CSSU, are not prepared for their entry level places. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say we should kind of be happy with, and I know that's not what you're saying, but be content with this and think, oh, okay, for those kids who are interested, we're all set. Because really the core foundational level of science knowledge ought to be pretty high for everyone, for them to make, every student, for them to make a reasoned decision about whether or not this is an appealing career choice. Mm -hmm. And it appears that across the country, and in Vermont is not really that different, though we do very well, but we're not that different, it appears that that foundational 
place isn't as high as it ought to be and that our kiddos, when they graduate from high school, just aren't as prepared as they should be. And I would think, Dave, that, that separation that you're talking about, you know, I mean, I took, I took high school chemistry and then I said, there's no way I'm taking physics. <laughs> um, Unfortunately, and now everything. Well, sorry, um, but that you know, really, really that that separation is, is you know, how many kids do we have in proficient with distinction as opposed to proficient? That arguably all of the students should be in proficient, or or darn near all of them ought to be, you know, proficient or above. And the ones who are going to go to MIT and RPI uh, are you know the ones that you want to see in proficient with distinction as opposed to uh, you know. Mm -hmm. It's kind of where, where do we plateau or where do they start to separate out into pursuing what they're more interested in or passionate about. Yeah. Yeah. And ultimately, you, we're comparing those scores internationally. So how are our children doing internationally? And, you know, obviously this is one small, you know, Shelburne Community School, but our children don't do that well internationally any longer. So how can we raise those scores so we're more competitive? Yeah. And you know, question. part of the drive for the next gen standards is the fact that not only do we feel like kids aren't graduating with a really strong foundation in science, but then that whole STEM, you know, technology engineering aspect of it is truly deficient because our curricula that we've been using for all these years just doesn't have it. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to see a, a shift gradually, a, a shift in uh, student focus and interest and teacher instructional habits and all of those things around science with the STEM piece built in because the next gen has that. It's going to be an interesting transition, mm -hmm. I think. We have chosen to use our, the, the position of math coordinator and then I think in the verbal areas we've had a coordinator, but we've never had a science coordinator. I mean, does this indicate maybe that they're, you know, yeah, well, it's, it's interesting because I mean, a couple of our conversations, one comment to Dave is we don't have that many students who go on to major in mathematics in college either. That, that's pretty rare. And yet we can achieve 85% in math. Hmm. So we're doing something different there. And, and I, as I look at what we've done, we, we've made a targeted K-12, we have curriculum, we have coordinators. We, we've made it a fundamental focus. and. Although we talked about science, I don't think we made the commitment to science that we've made to math and literacy. Mm -hmm. and but, is, but is that the building block that you need? You know, okay, so we figured out this building block of math and literacy and informational text with structured responses is the next step. Yeah. Um, but then you think like science is, I mean, I don't know what this test is. I mean, it's this test, earth science, chemistry, this, it is, is it, I mean, is it all it is, kinds it is, of those things? It is, it is content, it is analyzing data. There's actually a section where the students undergo, they, they create and do a hands-on experiment and write up the experiment. Yeah. So it, it has all elements of it. Okay. It's and really it, a well-designed test. It's a very good have, test, actually. I think we should all oh. have to take the eighth grade knee caps. Yeah. <laughs> you should. I think you should. You'd good. be surprised. No doubt. You would be surprised. <laughs> yeah, we, the rigor. Yeah, That's right. It would be staggering. <laughs> How much do you remember if you're on a chart? <laughs> <laughs> right. Sorry, sorry. That's right. You have resources <laughs> without job. turning That's around. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. <laughs> we don't memorize that stuff anymore. I will say yeah. that Vermont's uh, science work in NECAP actually was referred to by the folks who developed the next gen. Right. Um, they looked at the inquiry aspect. You know, Vermont is ahead certainly in terms right. of the test yeah. that we use and what therefore we advocate because of that test our instruction should look like. So. Um, you know, after our, our yeah. meeting last night, what I really want to know is, how do we compare to Milton in this? Just go into the public portal and po you can find that. I wanted to qualify a mistake I made earlier. Um, I was talking about our eighth graders and uh, CSSU's eighth graders improved 6%. I told you that was the state. I'm so sorry. Right. The state eighth graders improved 3% overall. So oh, that's at eighth grade. Right. We Sorry. Actually, we actually are, I, I would say, significantly behind Hinesburg and Charlotte. 
and doing really this great year. scores. This year. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hinesburg yep. made a big jump this year. Some places mm -hmm. just suddenly shot up. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Which gives us the opportunity to ask, what are they doing? Yeah. I mean, that, well, that's the beauty of having any, our folks together. Is there any, I mean, can we, maybe there it's is. too soon to tell. No. Uh, maybe we've just gotten Thanks. results, but if we could know what Heinsberg and, and Heinsberg and Charlotte. Heinz Charlotte. Eighth graders are oftentimes the highest in the state mm -hmm. scoring. Um, and Heinsberg made an enormous leap at eighth grade this year. And there will be things we can talk about, we'll yeah. chat about that. Right. Make me think about that. Because you bring those coordinators together, and yep. we, we have that. Yep, we have a really Ron strong. Ron Pam, great leaders in that group, and absolutely very much in this conversation. They, I mean, they open these with great anticipation yep. because they put a tremendous amount of work in so far, and you just kind of bang your head and go, okay, well, that didn't do it. So what are we going to do now? Yep. Uh, I just want to make one more comment, and then we should probably keep moving we'll on. Yeah. Um, you know, you asked about coordinators, and we've had this conversation in, in past budget discussions right. that, you know, once upon a time when the uh, literacy coordinator and math coordinator positions were created, and this actually, I think, predates my uh, tenure on the board, um, they weren't meant to be permanent positions, mm -hmm. and, and they've become permanent positions, and, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm not arguing that, but, right. you know, we have talked about you know, should we, you know, do we need a literacy coordinator and should that position become a science coordinator? Uh, so, you know, I, I, I and, um, you know, I'm not sure that we want to be out on our own because I think all of the K-8 schools have literacy and math coordinators right now, um, but maybe it's a, an SU level conversation. Again, how, how do we attack science? Yeah. Right. Uh, and, and, and in the era of limited resources, where does that come from uh, if we need to focus more there? Yeah. So. And when you measure your priorities and you know, think about um, the layers of responsibility that have become wedded to the, the coordinator role, which has morphed tremendously over whatever, six, seven, sure. eight years. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Built into the CSSU science plan ha has been the notion, I think next year, um, though I don't think we'll make that happen yet, but is the notion of a, starting with a part-time uh, science coordinator. So it's been, t like you said, it's been talked about, but I don't think anyone can imagine the jobs that the literacy and math coordinators do being reduced. I mean, they're just completely overloaded now. So we would have to engage in that conversation altogether. But it's on the radar, for sure. Mm -hmm. And looking at the rest, we'll talk about facilities and our facilities report. I think I can jump over that. Yep. Um, the, probably the only thing other than numbers that I would highlight is I did want the, the board to be aware that as, as part of the Vermont Principals Association, we can enter in cooperative agreements with other schools. Mm -hmm. It's kind of on a situation for our sports programs where if both schools feel there's a mutual benefit to coordinating the programs, typically it's a numbers base. This year, Charlotte didn't have enough girls to field a field hockey team. We had low numbers that it would have been right on the cusp of having one team with a lot of kids, but not enough for two. Yeah. So we signed a cooperative agreement for that one season and their students, a couple of them came over, played with us, real win-win. And so we've got the possibility of doing that, but it is very much a, a once in a while type thing. But we've got good cooperation, especially amongst the SU, because we always seem to be on those cusps of just enough kids or, so okay. made it work. So it's one team or two teams? We have two teams this year. So some of the girls on the Shelburne team are from Charlotte. Exactly, Okay. that's how that works out. All right. yep. And they were Shelburne on. Uh, we didn't lose the name and rights, did we? They we were. No, no. No. <laughs> Colors, Bradley. <laughs> and, yep. But only for field hockey. <laughs> yep. So let, just, I didn't see this last night when I read these for uh, PTO, but the SCAT program, uh -huh. that's, that's kind of the enrichment that folks were targeting at the, mm -hmm. at the budget forum. But it's only the, you know, it's, Sixth, it's, a, seventh and eighth grade, it's a middle school thing, but they're short programs. And, and let's, I, I want to make sure that we're clear on the intention of it because it operates during the sports season intentionally. Mm -hmm. So when we refer to an enrichment, what we do is we have tryouts for our sports 
and then we look literally at the students who we know are not going to get involved in the athletic program right. and create things to get those students to stay after school and bust them because we know the importance of having them involved in something. Okay. I mean, literally this year, this Minecraft, I don't know if you are familiar with Minecraft, but... Tim, are you familiar with Minecraft? Yes, I am. <laughs> we'll be attending Minecon 2013. Yes. Right on November 1st. Yeah. I mean, that one was literally created out of the blue. We looked and said, we've got this group of students. What can we get them involved in? And if you go in our lab, 13 boys and one girl, two days a week after school, just absolutely engaged in this game. To call it enrichment would be a stretch. <laughs> um, but, but you know, my, but my, two kids, my two kids play it, and it's the cutest thing. It the is. two of them sitting on the couch next to each other, like, coaching each other through certain sections. They're like, oh my gosh, look at this. This is amazing. Yeah. You know, from that aspect. Other. They're talking True. to each other, and they're not fighting. Yeah. Yeah. Truly the power of socialization is really yeah. Yeah. what that is. I mean, it's a, it's a targeted, and, and knowing some kids will go home and would just be sitting by themselves. And, and here we've got them with a group of their peers with a positive adult. And that, that's what's happening in each of these. And okay. Sue Schaefer coordinates it, and she's already looking at who isn't going to play basketball during the basketball season and what can we create that will get those students involved. Really cool. I mean, it's real intentional. So it's, it's a little different than enrichment, but mm -hmm. it is enrichment in the social context for sure. Yeah. Is it a potential model to use for younger kids, not necessarily as an alternative yeah. to athletics, but in that there's a long conversation about after school yeah, at the forum. Yeah. So definitely okay. the more yeah. the, the the more positive activities that are mentally and physically engaging we can do with young people the better we know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and, it, and we couldn't just run school till six o'clock anyways. That wouldn't work. We know <laughs> that. How is, how is rugby uh, being pursued? I mean, is, is that a, the real sport? Is it is the real sport of rugby. <laughs> there really? is a, they have a rugby club here at CBU, um, and that gentleman comes over, and they're out there learning to play rugby. Wow. Yeah. Any it's, issues with headgear and helmets and concussions or anything? They don't wear it, really? Because they don't wear helmets. <laughs> they, they don't wear it. They don't have to worry about it. No issues whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> That's the beauty of rugby. <laughs> That's why we should. That's why we should get rid of uh, face masks in football. <laughs> <laughs> no, our concussions come through our soccer program. Yes, yes. we have where play. Where you use your head. That's right. Um, yeah. You can see our numbers. I mean, I think we've talked a lot about Mass Studio, but again, it's just, we've had our Mass Studios. We have four of them going. Um, it's it's a substantial investment in in our staff, and it's playing great rewards. It really is. Um, I mean, it's still referred to by most of the staff as the best professional development they've ever been involved in. And, and students' progress demonstrates that as well. Exactly. I mean, their scores are unbelievable this year on obviously just the first assessments they've done. Mm -hmm. So those would be like unit assessments. Yeah. They've done great. Well, we turned over a few kids, but we're still at 765. Yeah. Yeah. Shifted, few come, few go, but you know, that's, that seems to be a good number for us right now. Um, is it? Uh, I was just going to go to the CSSU debrief, but again. Oh, I just wondering, is it possible to ask parents of the kindergarten kids, like, you know, where'd you guys come from? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for lack of a better word, it's you a philosophical because question. we were looking at the the projections and everything, and you know, my son has a friend who went into kindergarten. He moved from Charlotte, you know, so there's one of the eighty-four. But yeah. you know, can we just? Go out and ask the 84 and ask them to anonymously tell us, like, did you move into town? Why? Or anything like that? Or, or, I'm just curious, like, our projection was so off. I just, yeah. How, there... how detailed do you want that information? I mean, do you want it really detailed? Because what we could do is just ask Patty Spagnolo. That's what um, I was going to say. The, yeah, the because source of all information. She will, yeah, the source of all. <laughs> <laughs> the no, the all-knowing Patty was 60 today. Ooh, but anyway, she would be able to tell us um, pretty much, you know, within, I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, it's not going to be 100% specific. How many of the kids, of the kids moved um, in? Yeah. Um, she, how many of them were second kids from an existing family? Yeah, yeah we could find something like that. Totally. That's, yep. 
Yep. It just struck me as some information that would It's actually a, be that's a good question yeah. as we approach the next cycle, because that's going to be one of our big questions. What do we project? The, the, <laughs> question, the question is, though, well, you know, does it indicate from one year to the next? Does it trend does at all? It, right. right. What, what, what well, we're going to end up with. Well, yeah, but I, I, I think it can indicate where we look for numbers other than birth rates, which is what we're using now. And ask them how many of them want to move to our town. <laughs> 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 but maybe, but, but if we, we find out that these are second kids and we didn't know about it, then mm -hmm. that's, that's primarily, that's, that would be interesting. If, mm -hmm. Who knows if that's the case, but if that's the case, then... Or we should just tell them we can't come then, right, Dave? No, <laughs> no, 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 everyone is welcome. <laughs> I, I think well, we could also collect that data, and obviously you need three years for any kind of trend, but it might be interesting to yeah. see what that trend is because right now, as we said last night, we don't have great figures. I we, think, you know, one part of it is if you can, under, you know, especially with, um, I forget the name of the program, but, you know, basically the, the preschool triple program. E. Triple, triple E. No, not Triple E. Oh, the uh, the er, Early Learning F Partnership yeah. numbers. Yeah. You know, I think that's where you understand how many kid, how many Shelburne kids are in programs. You know, that are eventually open. in the preschool that we can anticipate, and then if you could project, okay, X percent in an average year then comes from move-ins. Mm -hmm. You know, that that might help us better project what we're going to have in the way of kindergarten kids showing up in a given year. But mm -hmm. it's still something of a crapshoot. Um, it, it's so difficult. So, um, all right, so the next item is uh, the CSSU debrief. Um, three out of five of us were there, and actually a, a fair amount of it was uh, um, outside of the, the common topic, uh, was a discussion of purchase services, which is actually on our uh, agenda here as a discussion matter, so we'll certainly get into that. Um, we did have an interesting vote on... Um, uh, selecting a new auditor for Chittenden South and on a um, six to five vote with one abstention voted to um, go to a new auditor we, we've had the same one for the uh, for the last eight ten twelve years something along those lines and and you know nothing against the current auditor that there were a number of us myself included who um, just felt that you know it's kind of our fiduciary responsibility to change that up periodically uh, so that, that you know, we will be going to do a, a new auditor for a four-year contract, uh, and then after that, we'll we'll see. So, uh, anything else you guys from the CSSU meeting that uh, Dave or Tim might need to? Uh, so, next item is uh, communications uh, board boards corners. Um, one of the, actually one of the, the Charlotte members of the negotiations committee is working on a board corner uh, kind of for all of us to, to use um, so that hopefully we'll have that in the next week or so. Just, you know, kind of like I did one last week for, you know, here, you know here's the kickoff to budget season, and, you know, mm -hmm. something of a here's a kickoff to, uh, you know, the next round of teachers negotiations. So um, that, that's one that, you know, we, we should see between now and our uh, November meeting. Uh, so, if there's other thoughts, interests in you know, writing something, um, we'll Alan and I were thinking about perhaps something for the facilities committee. Um, I don't, great. not quite sure if we'll be ready by sometime in November for that. We have our next meeting early November. Okay. What, what's your thinking about that? Maybe. Well. I mean, our, our hope was to, we were going to have the, the public forum on November 12th and that right. something that would generate some interest. Before um, then. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Although we can also just focus through our school newsletter, getting that, that communication there, because it's primarily folks that are in the school that we need to catch their attention catch and attention. get their feedback from. So. And I just realized I went straight from 5.2 to 6.3. But it was a good jump. Uh, nice yeah. jump. Yeah. 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 You know, we're not going to bother with 6.1 and 6.2. That's true. Thank you. Yeah. Prerogative. Yeah. You know, Tim, you're supposed to kick me under the table when I do that. Oh, my battery died on my iPad. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, anyhow, uh, so why don't we circle back to that? We'll, we'll give that some more thought, especially at you. Know, we, we shorted everybody on the facilities uh, committee report, so why don't, why don't we do that uh, 
5.3, and then we'll come back to uh, Board Corners in its proper position on the okay. agenda. Um, I'll start off, and, and uh, hopefully we'll you in, will yes. fill in as yep. needed. Um, we've been meeting with David Epstein yep. of Truex Cullen, and are <laughs> progressing um, now to go ahead and do uh, pretty much an assessment of what needs to be done in the building, I believe. W weren't they meeting right, right afterwards um, yep. with, uh, a, who was the other professional that they were meeting with? It's I another, can't remember. the gentleman who was able to create a report for us that will look at the facilities and make some cost estimates. Cost estimates, right, a cost estimator. Um, and then present that to, the, to our committee and um, we're going to be coming out with more regular meeting minutes from that um, sure. meeting um, and updating everybody on, on how that will go. Do we have, or have you guys discussed a place on the um, website for, you know, facilities committee you know, page or something? No, we haven't, lines? but that's no. a grand okay. idea. You know, and, especially as, as, you know, things really start to get fleshed sure. out. Yeah. Uh, I think that would probably yeah. be something that we would want to uh, would want to have. Mm -hmm. um, has there been much conversation on asbestos? Um, None at all. Okay. It, Actually, it, the re reason I ask about that, um, yeah, Elaine's nodding her head. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one, we know that there's these panels on the outside of the building that have asbestos, um, but there are other places in the building that are, you know, by and large out of sight, and and you know some up in the ceilings and behind the walls and various things, but Bob Mason shared something with me. I, I think I had to like sign off on something that there's some sort of, uh, whether it's state or federal regulation that you have to, um, you know, I don't know if it's an asbestos auditor or what exactly the deal is, but um, that costs us money each year to certify something or other. Um, and I apologize for my lack of command of the details on it, but you know, it, it, it does come down to, okay, there is a certain cost associated with that every year, as opposed to, you know, Sorry, ripping out walls out. or, you know, tearing down mm -hmm. ceilings to go in and, and get rid of it. So it's like an inspection, and then at the end of the inspection, mm -hmm. we are... My guess is that probably it. somebody who comes in and says, this is a friable asbestos, and therefore it's not causing any harm, and right. you need to right. do that annually to yeah. ensure the safety of everybody in the building. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you don't want to do that, then you got to get rid of it to make sure that at no time does it become friable and therefore yeah, a health hazard. Yep, so and the question. specifics on it are it's it's the it's the pipe insulation in the ceiling of the 1967 wing, and so we we do have a significant amount there as part of our facilities maintenance. We're we're actually we had a contractor in yesterday, <coughs> and it's probably something we're going to try to tackle under our current own and budget throughout the coming year because it just it, it's it's problematic where it is is at and we do have to inspect it every year because if it starts to break down we have to do immediate remediation mm -hmm. and it just pays just solve that problem so, so there might be a payback i mean we could we might be able to measure the payback I think just so. to get the whole thing taken, just taken care of taken but if care it, i mean if it can be done within the and it can be done within over, the regular we, budget. we're discussing with the contract it can be done over breaks it can be done Mm -hmm. you know, two, three days at a time, we can come in and, and punch out chunks and, and get it done without closing down the shop. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really think we're going to start tackling it. We've actually got okay. the bid coming in. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Um, yeah, so you say you're Anything meeting else? again in November? Yeah, our next meeting is early November. I think November 4th or November no, 6th, uh, I believe. 6th, right. We, it's usually we had scheduled Thursday a mornings. community forum for a Tuesday after a PTO meeting, like we've done the budget. Right. Which will be a chance to kind of. So just I would start definitely think you would want to get a, a board corner out, which, if you wouldn't mind writing right. ahead of a, you know, a community forum, but I think that's great to, to do that mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and start to get some awareness. Uh, that is coming of what we're of what we're the looking process at. Yep. And yep. Yep. We, we may have discussed this already, but it, would it be worth putting something in, in either as in a board corner or as an article in the Shelburne News to just make the community aware that our playground has reached the end of its useful life and 
because it did come up last night. It did come up last night. And the, somebody mentioned the Charlotte playground that I guess it's just it's amazing. You know, mm -hmm. Everybody, and you know, if there were community awareness, we might get somebody to, you know, a Pizzagalli step to, uh, out and say <laughs> donate. <"Yeah, them." laughs> Pizzagalli Park, you know, we there. could sell a sign, the, 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 the rights, the naming rights to it. You know, right. It's exactly. our name. I was gonna say it has a name. It has a name. <laughs> it's the Snelling Park. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they purchase those rights in perpetuity. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> well, maybe Snelling will, you know, want to renew the uh, the name on. It. <laughs> maybe we should go to the Cunin family and see if they'll. Uh, well, I know that uh, my co-chair and I are delinquent on that, but uh, we're going to get back on it. I'm finally getting uh, my head around my primary job, so we're. Uh, your primary job of playground work is it? No, that is not. That's going to become my new primary job. Yeah, I mean it's it's tough because every you know there's people that know that it's coming. Yeah, and everybody has certain opinions. Um, you know, there's there's the access debate, which you know we have to have access for everyone. Yeah, and things have changed since that playground was built 25 years ago. And then there's the debate of a uh, traditional versus a natural playground. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's difficult because I really want to step away from that and listen to what people want to say. But at the same time, you know, I did get those two estimates and I looked at them with Dave and it's staggering that a playground is sixty to eighty thousand dollars. And we can't salvage anything that we have. You know, we may even need to completely redo the flooring of what we have. You know, they've, they've changed the, word, the, the name now. It's, it's not a playground anymore. It's a payground. It's a payground. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's a... Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it, yeah. But that's... That's with everything. So, so um, next item uh, is... Uh, 6.1 the SU purchase services so um, that's in our packets tonight um, so we can just kind of quickly go through that and Dave and, and Tim if you have any questions as I said we you know spent um, Bob Mason gave a, a presentation on that but you know basically these are um, you know, they're, they're services that are sourced through the supervisory union um, for the most part, it's, it's, you know, greater efficiencies either in, you know, executing the programs or, uh, you know, making larger purchases so that, uh, you know, we're getting better costs on, on that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, in a nutshell, it's uh, information technology, um, CY programs, connecting youth, and, and that's actually, uh, I, I guess we're, in the second year of a, a major change in how we have treated that in the past where um, it was kind of um, almost an off-budget program mm -hmm. that you know usually came looking for money at some point in the year because grants didn't quite materialize or whatever and, and, and grants are becoming you know harder to get uh, so we made the decision a uh, year ago, I guess, to, um, you know, to bring that program and its revenues uh, onto, the, um, onto the, the, the district budget. So we'll talk more about that one in a minute. Uh, food service, transportation, um, CISEI, and I don't know what that stands for. It used to be families, infants, and toddlers. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll take a look at that. Uh, psych services, occupational services, uh, English language services and early learning partnership. Um, I think information technology is fairly uh, fairly self-explanatory. Uh, connecting youth, as I mentioned, uh, you know, detail on this on page two of that. Um, how we um, you know gradually transition that onto the budget. Some pieces of the connecting youth are done by allocation. Uh, so, you know, how many kids are, you know, what's the average daily membership and, and allocate it out that way. The balance of it is, uh, you know, actual services. What, what services are, you know, is, is a school getting. Uh, food service, I think, is, uh, you know, that's all done based on, you know, actual usage. Uh, 
transportation again that's all done based on uh, on usage with the exception I, I i assume that ken and pat are allocated out based on usage um you know the, the percentages of their uh of their salaries um molly maybe you could do justice to CISEI better than i can uh, I, or is that really megan's uh, i could try it's megan's okay. bailiwick <laughs> but um basically it's around these two people who support the program and we're required to provide um, special education services, birth to three. And I think this is all based on number of students in, in mm -hmm. your town. It's part of your service. So it's, yeah. Right. Thank you. Can you clarify again what it stands for? Oh. Nope. Children and Infant <laughs> Services. Oh, that's pretty mm. good. And I'll buy that. <laughs> Early, early intervention. intervention. Early intervention. intervention. Early intervention. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's that acronym dictionary. Yeah. Integrated services. Integrated. Thank I, you. I think there's a rule at the SU office that they change the acronyms every five years for each. Yeah, I know it comes from the state. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Way too complicated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Psych uh, psychological services, uh, again, th these are um, the rescue employees, I guess, but the, the, again, that's allocated out based on usage, you know, the number of days or the amount of service that, uh, you know, the administration in, in each building is requesting. Um, same thing with occupational and therapy services. Um, English language learners, uh, same thing, and, and, and this is something we, we talked about that um, no matter what number we use, we're going to be wrong. <laughs> uh, because these families, I think, have a tendency perhaps to move in and move out more so than others. Um, but it's definitely trending up. I mean, certainly a, a, as the supervisory union, it is trending up because there are more people uh, through whatever social service programs and that sort of thing in this area. There are just more and more of these, these folks, uh, you know, moving into this area. And so we're, we're getting our share. Uh, and then early learning partnership, we talked a little bit about that when we were talking about uh, you know, kindergarten enrollment. This is the, um, the state mandated um, uh, preschool program, which I think is like mm -hmm. three and four year olds or three to five, you know, depending on when they go to kindergarten. So um, this is not something that we will vote on tonight, but we will need to vote on, I think, in one of our earliest budget meetings. Um, there's a grid on it, you know, numbered page six here, um, that checks off all of the different things that um, the Shelburne takes part in, and we take part in all of them. Mm -hmm. um, so, or, or historically we have, and so we, we will need to vote whether we want to continue uh, to take part in these uh, for purchase services. Is FIT what is now CISEI? That's uh, CISEI. Yeah, okay. right. um, I, I think the column width wasn't enough for Bob to change it there, so he kept the old. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll talk, talk to your legislator and yeah. see, if they can, uh, see if they can fix that. So, so Russ, uh, this is on your um, work plan for approval next month. So this month 13th. it would yeah. So okay. this month it would be to give Bob and everybody else the kind of the, the heads up. Right. Yeah, I mean, we it, intend to be in the pool. Yeah, I, I wouldn't not. anticipate any, you know, reason why. I mean, I, I, nobody's been agitating to, uh, you know, to ditch the, you know, the transportation and to, go, to outsource it. I, 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 like I think he gave up on that. No. Um, <laughs> I thought Dave was going to start his own bus company, though. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, and he's doing some market research. Yeah. Bicyclists. Has it been decided how we're going to get charged for the purchase services? Is it going to be based on the ADM, or is it going to be based well, on the you know, usage? What, what we talk, you know, each of them is different. It, it depends on, um, you know, depends on what the service is, and, so, and whether or not you can accurately allocate that right. out. I mean, you know, we did have the conversation about uh, a little bit about special ed, and you know how the uh, uh, the Paris can be treated that you know that's a discretionary decision and I think you know the consensus seemed to be that you know they should stay within those you know within our budget but mm -hmm. um, you know that was a discussion we had last year um, or, or certainly last school year about special ed now that that's becoming a supervisory union level thing is that for the 2000 when, when does that go on is that 2014 2018, July okay. 1, 2014. And, and there was you know a lot of conversation 
about whether that one should be done based on ADM or whether that should be done on services and at least for now we're, we're going based on the actual services used because there was a pretty big disparity I'm not going to publicly point fingers at another district um, right but they have a lot of right. they've had a lot of shopping centers in that town um, <laughs> where the you know the, the cost per per you know student were significantly higher than they were well, on the average. Well, I want to clarify that. The cost per student isn't mm -hmm. higher. They okay. have many more students. No, but there was a, there was a difference the different, in the... Right, but if, if we do by ADM and they have more special ed students proportionally, that's what's causing the differential. No. There was something yeah. that we said that we're going to stick for now to doing it based on actual need. Uh, as opposed to doing a straight ADM okay. application. Good. So um, we'll have to go back and look at those. Uh. And just looking at this, you know, if you look from food service to the right, it's all based on what you ask for. Yeah. Much of it based on the service plan, meaning based on what you need to provide need. to individual students. They, I, I think, you know, there's only a few administrative costs for some of those programs that's harder to, to mm -hmm. allocate out right. based on that. But by and large, those expenses are all based on, yeah. you know, uses, hence the name purchase services. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that. So any, any questions, concerns, things that we might want to uh, strike out on our own? Um, so the budget forum debrief, uh, I guess I was the only one who wasn't there. Uh, <coughs> I was here for two and a half, almost three hours worth of nego you know, negotiations committee uh, meetings. So um, I think I would, would have rather been at the budget forum, mm -hmm. or budget forum, but uh, sounds like we had a good, good, you know, decent turnout and, and good conversation, good discussion at the, uh, the meeting last night. Very supportive community. Yeah. Yeah. I thought they were terrific and Patty and Alan, you, you guys did a great job. You really handled all the all the questions and very well. No no surprises, no uh, I don't think so. you know, mm -hmm. thing, How things many that people? Well I mean realistically I think we had the board, the, budget the administration, <laughs> all the budget buddies and one parent. I heard well, there were two. Four. There were two. Two, two extra parents. Two. Which, yeah. which is frankly kind of par for the course. Yeah, right. That's, um, that's that, that in itself is an indication. Right. right. Mm -hmm. That's what Russ says. They would totally I mean, be that. there if yeah. there were concerns. On the back. And, and it ended on a really high note where people were talking about what is really good and valuable about our school. Mm -hmm. And nice. that was just terrific. It really was. That's great. So, so now we can talk about Board's Corners. Um, Thanks so, for that <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, you know, we, we will have one coming, um, should be coming before the next, um, the next board meeting on November 13th, uh, about the negotiations that will be starting up. And, um, you know, we want to have one at some point in the not too distant future on facilities, uh, just sort of a open question on what's the timing on that. So, uh, what were you thinking for a public forum on that? What, what's the timing on that uh, what is it November, November. 12th? Second, second week in November oh, so was it the 12th yeah I thought second it was the 12th Tuesday, yeah. second November 12th yeah. after the PTO meeting will, will you be um, at a point that you can do it at that I mean, yep. will, will, will you know enough at that point to do it or does it need to be in Still. December no we really thought we would know enough because okay. at, at this point early on we have several public forums kind of laid out in the in the timeline and this first one was to kind of present what we've been able to collect from administration and potentially from the program council about educational specifications kind of the vision for where this work could go forward yeah. and i think it's time to lay that on the table the same way we do with the budget and just say okay have we missed anything from a public view um share the maintenance and just basically bring people up to speed okay uh, so, so that would say that we should have a board corner on the subject on either October 31st, is that Halloween, mm -hmm. uh, or November 7th, which would be on my birthday. Oh, um, happy what a birthday. nice Thank birthday you. present. Uh, so, you know, take, next... take your pick on that, but it, you know, it, it should be, if we're going to, if we're going to have that. Um, Our um, next facilities meeting is on the 7th. Is it the seventh? Yes, we don't have a meeting before then. Okay. 
can we write an article before the next meeting? I mean, I don't know that. I, I, I assume, I mean, um, part of it is just we've got a facilities got committee. A facilities committee. And, All right. and, and here's who's these on it. These are the it, things that we're looking at. And these are the things I, I, would, I would think you've identified. Broad general. Broadly, you know, part of it is a roof. Um, part of it is the, the right. class, you know, the wings. Kind of with answering the, a why now question because it has to do with the financials of it. Yeah, yeah, the timing of it. So uh, I, I think there's enough there. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I would. So is the next meeting the 6th or the 7th? Uh, it is Thursday morning, the 7th, the 7th. at 7.30 a.m. We'd love to have you join us. I'll see what I can do, Kathy. All right. So, um, Kathy, are you good then for, yeah. you know, it, it would need to be submitted on either uh, the 4th or the tw 4th of November or the 28th of October, depending on uh, you know, when. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah. So I think, you know, between that and the, and the, uh, the negotiations, one was probably covering what we need to. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, you and I should coordinate um, when you know which one we submit, I'm not sure when the negotiations one is is going to be uh, ready. We meet next on October 22nd, um, so you know I don't think I'd have that one. You know, that might be ready then that we could then submit that one uh, on the 28th and have that go in the paper on the 31st, uh, and, and then maybe the you know yours the following week. Yeah, that okay. sounds good to me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's that. Uh, we have no action matters tonight. Um, we do have a consent agenda uh, to approve the uh, minutes and the director's orders from last time. So if I can get a motion to approve that. So moved. Please. Second. And uh, all in favor to approve the consent agenda? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, confirming the next meeting dates, uh, we have the community forum tomorrow night. Don't miss it. Mm -hmm. You guys going to go for calendar 2.0? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really tired. Is that a request <laughs> from my board chair? No, <laughs> no, no. I heard he has hockey and... Uh, yeah, yes, it is, yes, it is, but you may wear a disguise. It is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Big target. Yeah. So then, I won't no know one if, will ever then we won't know if you're there or not, if it's a clever enough disguise. So. Come chest. How about a guinea pig? Yeah. Dressed as Russ Caffrey. Yeah. 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 For sure. So, no, I, I, I intend to go, and I think several yeah. of you guys uh, are planning to go. It, it should be fascinating. Wouldn't miss it. Uh, so, um, so that's tomorrow night. Um, where, where will it be? Again? It's here somewhere. Uh, it says the cafeteria. So, um, oh, it says the cafeteria. Well, that's what it says on here. Yeah. Um, whether or not that's oh, big enough that? and they have to move it to the, move gym, the gym, I don't know. Yeah. I, I heard mention of the auditorium. Auditorium. That's not little. big enough. Small uh, cafeteria, is it? Yeah, it's much smaller. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I don't think it seats more than a couple hundred people, but I, I don't 630. know. It seats 400. Does it really? Well, yeah. no. They'll probably direct people from the front entrance. Yeah, well. uh, it was 400 in Essex. Okay. Oh, I think really? they are. I think they are thinking about it. Yeah. You'll know when you get here. They'll have a <laughs> size up, but I'm pretty sure they're thinking about the, the auditorium. I would want to take up a seat. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> so, um, so the next uh, this board chair meeting um, budget forum we did that already so that's I'm not sure why yeah, that's I wondered, on there. Yeah, I I was going to talk ask about that why that's on there. Do you think? Because I think it's a mistake. Um, okay. Well, originally we were going to have it a week later and then Brandy asked to move it up. It's just that's why okay. that was there. So. So um, strike that. So then we've got our next regular meeting on the uh, on the thirteenth here. On the thirteenth. Yeah. So, um, and then we have on the agenda. I, I I would like to have an executive session. Shouldn't take more than a few minutes. Um, and so if I can get a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing uh, negotiations. So moved. I have a second. Second. So and we will um, we'll we'll adjourn from negotiate you know from um, from the executive session. So. Um, we are done.